He remarked that he had done much for Antwerp, but that this was little in comparison with what he proposed to do. He intended to have rendered it a fatal point of attack to the enemy by sea and by land to have made it a certain resource and a point of national security in case of great disasters. He would have rendered Antwerp capable of receiving a whole army in its defeat and holding out against a close siege for the space of a year, during which time he said a nation would be enabled to rally in a mass for its deliverance and to resume the offensive. Five or six places of this kind were he added to constitute the new system of defense which he intended to have established. The works which had been completed in so short a time at Antwerp, the numerous dockyards, magazines, and canals, were already the subject of admiration, but all this the emperor declared to be nothing. Antwerp was as yet, he said, merely a commercial town. A military town was to be constructed on the opposite bank of the river. For this purpose, ground had been purchased at a low rate, and it was to have been sold again at a high profit for the purpose of building, so that by this speculation the expenses attending the enterprise would have been considerably diminished. The winter docks would have been capable of admitting three deck ships with all their guns on board, and covered dry docks were to have been constructed for laying up vessels in time of peace. The emperor remarked that the scheme he had formed would have rendered Antwerp a stupendous and colossian bulwark, and that it would have been a whole province in itself. Adverting to this superb establishment, he observed that it had been one of the causes of his exile to St. Helena, that the demand for the cession of Antwerp was one of the circumstances that led him to reject the conditions of peace proposed to Chatillon. If the Allies had agreed to leave him in possession of Antwerp, he would in all probability have concluded peace, and he questioned whether he had not done wrong in refusing to sign the proposed ultimatum. At that period, said he, I had doubtless many resources and chances, but yet how many may be said in favor of the resolution I adopted. I did right, added he, in refusing to sign the ultimatum, and I fully explained my reasons for that refusal. Therefore, even here on this rock, amidst all my misery, I have nothing to repent of. I am aware that few will understand me, but in spite of the fatal turn of events, even the common mass of mankind must now be convinced that duty and honor left me no other alternative. If the Allies had thus far succeeded in degrading me, would they have stopped there? Were their offers of peace and reconciliation sincere? I know them too well to put faith in their professions. Would they not have availed themselves of the immense advantages afforded them by the treaty to finish by intrigue? What they had commenced by force of arms, then where would have been the safety, independence, and future welfare of France? Where would have been my honor, my vows? Would not the Allies have ruined me in the estimation of the people as effectually as they ruined me on the field of battle? They would have found public opinion too ready to receive the impression which it would have been their aim to give to it. How would France have reproached me for suffering foreigners to parcel out the territory that had been entrusted to my care? How many faults would have been attributed to me by the unjust and the unfortunate? Could the French people, full of the recollections of their glory, have patiently endured their burdens that would inevitably have been imposed on them? Hence would have arisen fresh commotions, anarchy, and desolation. I preferred risking the last chances of battle determined to abdicate in case of necessity. I acknowledge the justice of the emperor's observations. He had lost the throne, it is true, but voluntarily, and uh, because he preferred to renounce it rather than compromise our welfare and his own honor. History will appreciate this sublime sacrifice. Power and life are transitory, but glory endures and is immortal. 
But after all, said the emperor, the historian will perhaps find it difficult to do me justice, for the world is so overwhelmed with libels and falsehoods. My actions have been so misrepresented, my character so darkened and misunderstood. To this, someone present replied, the doubt could exist only during his life, that injustice would be confined solely to his contemporaries, that, as he had said himself, as he had already remarked, the clouds would disperse in proportion as his memory advanced in posterity, that his character would rise daily and become the noblest subject for the pen of history, and that, though the first catastrophe might have proved fatal to his memory, owing to the outcry that was then raised against him, yet the prodigies of his return, the acts of his brief government, and his exile to St. Helena now left him crowned with glory in the eyes of nations and posterity. That is very true, replied the emperor with an air of satisfaction, and my fate may be said to be the very opposite of others. A fall usually has the effect of lowering a man's character, but on the contrary, my fall has elevated me prodigiously. Every succeeding day divests me of some portion of my tyrant's skin. After a few moments of silence, the conversation was again resumed on the subject of Antwerp and the English expedition. The English government and its general, said the emperor, seemed to vie with each other in want of skill. If Lord Chatham, to whom our soldiers gave the nickname of my Lord Jatond, had resolved to make an energetic movement, he might doubtless have destroyed our valuable establishment by a coup de main. But the first moment being lost in our fleet return, the place was secure. There was a great deal of exaggeration respecting the efforts and measures taken for the safety of Antwerp. The zeal of the citizens was excited only for secret and criminal designs. On mentioning some facts of which I had been a witness, I happened to observe that it was generally marshals who reviewed armies, but that here the rule had been reversed and armies reviewed their marshals, three of whom had succeeded each other in a very short time. Political circumstances said the emperor called for this change. I sent Bessier to Antwerp because the crisis demanded a firm and confidential man, but as soon as the critical period was expired, I sent another to succeed Bessier because I wished to have the latter near me. The maritime works of Antwerp, notwithstanding their immense extent, are but a small portion of those which were executed by Napoleon, having been attached as a member of the Council of State to the Department of the Marine. I possess ex officio an account of these works, a list of which I will here insert in geographical order proceeding from the south to north. One for Fort are constructed for the purpose of enlarging and defending the anchorage of the Isle of X, whence by dint of perseverance and intrepidity a passage had been discovered out of sight of the enemy between Oleron and the mainland, by which even vessels of the line could reach the anchoring grounds of the Gironda and its outlets to the extensive and superb works of Cherbourg, the dike which was commenced under Louis the Sixteenth and which had suffered considerable injury during the Revolution, was repaired. The central part being elevated nine feet above the highest level of the sea and along an extent of a hundred toises, for the purpose of mounting a battery of twenty guns of the largest caliber. This work was executed in less than two years, from 1802 to 1804 and with such success that though it has been neglected since 1813, it has suffered no decay and still retains all its original strength. A large elliptical tower of granite was built in the center and within the dike which it supports and by which it is in its turn covered. The huge foundation of this work, which being constructed in the open sea, of course, presented enormous difficulties, was completed at the end of 1812 and raised to the height of six feet above the level of the highest tide. The solidity which it has preserved since that period, though in a state of neglect and exposed to the violent action of the waves, is the manifest proof of the strength of the defensive works that were projected on this artificial rock when the time should arrive for the full completion of the plan. 
His plan consisted in raising at the height of one story a barrack capable of containing the garrison, a powder magazine, a reservoir. This was to be surrounded by an arched platform, bomb-proof, and capable of receiving a casemated battery of 1936 pounders. And above this was to be a second platform capable of receiving mounted guns if necessary. The whole crowning, the central battery, already existing on the dike itself. Thus, the enemy's attack would have been resisted by four ranges of batteries, one above another. In less than eight years, a military post was formed by digging into the live rock. It was capable of containing 45 ships of the line, a proportional number of frigates, three slips for building. This asylum so necessary for ships of the line owing to the natural situation of the roads of Cherbourg, which are too much exposed to the violence of the waves, was dug 30 feet beneath the level of the sea at the lowest neap tide in order to afford at all times a secure station for the largest ships. When it was opened in 1813, the moles and dikes were fully completed along its whole extent. At that time, the Empress Maria Louisa and all her court witnessed the magnificent and sublime spectacle of the sudden eruption of the sea, which was admitted simply by the spontaneous rupture of the immense dam that had hitherto repelled its efforts. The largest vessels immediately entered the enclosure, which has since afforded a convenient station for shipping together with the requisite accommodations for building, repairing, and fitting out. In short, it possesses every advantage that might be expected in so important a creation of art and is justly considered to be one of the noblest monuments of Napoleon's reign. According to the Emperor's plan, this stupendous work was intended only as a first or outward port he had determined on constructing in a lateral direction at a little distance beyond in a second or inward port, which was to be commenced immediately and which would have been speedily completed owing to the precautions that were previously adopted. It was to be large enough to receive 25 ships of the line and behind these two ports and extending along their whole length in a semicircular form, there were to be built 30 covered docks where an equal number of sail of the line might be kept in constant readiness to be put to sea. Such were the immense works executed or planned at Cherbourg alone. Three, the numerous works occasioned by raising the flotilla for the invasion of England. It was necessary to provide anchorages to render the preparation simultaneously and to execute every offensive and defensive operation. All this required at various points the construction of forts in stone and woodwork, keys, basins, chattees, dams, sluices. Bologna was chosen as a central point of assemblage, and Vimaru, Amplitus, and Etapla were the secondary points. Bologna itself was rendered capable of receiving 2,000 ships of different kinds. Besides, its natural port, an artificial basin, was formed by means of a dam closed in the middle by a sluice. 24 feet wide, this basin was capable of containing eight or 900 ships afloat and in a constant state of readiness, and the sluice, by its power of resistance, had the advantage when closed of producing runs of water, which increased the depth of the natural port and freed its entrance from the obstruction of sandbanks. Fibiru, Tapla, and Amblotus were simultaneously rendered capable to receive a proportional number of ships. All these undertakings were completed in the space of two years. Four, important local repairs and improvements in all the ports of the coast. Havre was rendered accessible to frigates by destroying by means of a strong sluice. The gravel bank that obstructed its entrance improvements were made at St. Valerie de Yep Calais Gravelina and Dunkirk. The port of the latter was cleared, and the marsh that covered the town was drained. A second flotilla was to be assembled at Ostend to which a free entrance had been effected by clearing its canal. Five, the works of flushing, this town having momentarily fallen into the hands of the English. They destroyed all its military establishments when they invaded it. The 
emperor ordered the reconstruction of the works on a much more extensive scale than before, fully appreciating the important geographical situation of the place. He ordered the basin to be redug and enlarged as well as its entrance. The canal was also to be deepened so that the basin might be rendered capable of admitting even vessels of 80 tons and affording a winter station for a squadron of 20 ships, always ready to put to sea in one or two tides. This advantage was to be procured by means of a very ingenious plan suggested by the naval commandant of the place, and which consisted simply in confining the water at high tide in the ditches of the town. The basin was a most important acquisition, as it afforded the means of making naval preparations free of all the inconveniences of the Scheldt. Our ships would have been enabled to sail directly to the coast of England, and the English would thus have been compelled to keep cruisers constantly on the watch, whereas there too, as soon as they knew that our ships were disarmed in Flushing or returned to Antwerp on the approach of winter, they tranquilly went into port, having nothing to apprehend until the return of spring. But it was necessary to render the fortifications of Flushing equal to the protection of a whole squadron. Consequently, defensive works were multiplied on various points. Magazines and other establishments were reconstructed and orders were issued for rendering them bomb-proof and surmounting them with batteries. Fleshing would have been thickly planted with cannon on all points and would, in short, have been rendered impregnable. Six works commenced at Turnus, the importance of the western mouth of the Scheldt for enabling our fleet to sail in and out, and the inconveniences attending the return of our ships to Antwerp every year during the winter season suggested to the emperor the idea of establishing a still greater arsenal than flushing near the mouth of the river Ternusa on the left bank of the shell three leagues from the mouth of the river was the point fixed on and the works were immediately commenced they were however suspended on account of the great length of time as well as the enormous expense that would have been requisite for their completion seven the immense works at Antwerp this town which is nearly 20 leagues distant from the sea, from which it is separated by a winding road, seemed to be divested of every desirable advantage for the formation of a maritime arsenal, and it had hitherto presented only petty commercial establishments. A fleet raised in Antwerp would with difficulty have been able to descend the river, and would have been ill-defended against the in clemencies of the weather or the attempts of the enemy it would have been useless during one third of the year for the approach of winter force the ships to come up higher to avoid the current and ice of the river there being no floating basins but these numerous difficulties seemed as nothing in the eyes of Napoleon and his impatience to make the English feel the dangers of the Scheldt, which they had themselves so frequently acknowledged to be formidable. He speedily concerted his plans, and in less than eight years, Antwerp assumed the aspect of an important maritime arsenal, and a considerable fleet was ready riding in the Scheldt. Everything was done thoroughly and completely. Magazines keys dockyards were newly constructed a provisional asylum was assigned for the shipping in the rupel while two great floating basins were dug in the town of antwerp capable of receiving vessels of every side with all their guns on board 20 slips for building were raised all in a line as if by enchantment and 20 vessels lying in these slips at once presented to the traveler arriving by the tete de flandre the imposing and singular spectacle of 20 vessels of the line ranged as a squadron most of these works however napoleon regarded merely as a provision momentarily borrowed from commerce he intended to establish a complete and much larger arsenal facing Antwerp on the bank of the river opposite to the tete de flandre he at first conceived the bold design of throwing a bridge across the scheldt but he at length determined in favor of flying bridges of a very ingenious construction. The emperor, as I have already observed, had formed the grandest ideas respecting the improvements at Antwerp, and the details of his plan extended as far as the sea. He used to say that he intended to make Antwerp a province, a little kingdom to itself. 
to this object. He devoted himself with that degree of interest which he might be expected to evince in the execution of one of his most favorite projects. He made several journeys to Antwerp for the purpose of personally inspecting the works in the most trivial details. On one of these occasions, he happened to fall in with a captain or lieutenant colonel of engineers who was modestly assisting in the fortifications of the place and with whom he entered into the discussion of certain points connected with the business in which he was engaged. Shortly after, the officer unexpectedly received a letter informing him that he was appointed aide de camp to the emperor and directing him to repair to the Tuileries to enter upon his duties. The poor officer was filled with astonishment. He thought he was dreaming or that the letter had been misdirected. He was so extremely diffident and possessed so little knowledge of the world that this announcement of his promotion threw him into great perplexity. He recollected having once seen me at Antwerp, and he begged I would render him my assistance accordingly. On his arrival in Paris, he came and assured me of his total ignorance of court manners and the embarrassment he felt in presenting himself to the emperor. However, I soon succeeded in encouraging him, and before he reached the gate of the palace, he had mustered a tolerable degree of confidence. This officer was General Bernard, whose great talents were brought into notice by this circumstance, and who, at the time of our disasters, proceeded to America, where he was placed at the head of the military works of the United States. Napoleon loved to take people thus by surprise. Whenever he discovered talent, he never failed to raise it to the proper sphere without suffering himself to be swayed by any secondary considerations. This was one of his striking characteristics. Eight, the works in Holland. No sooner had Holland fallen into the hands of Napoleon than his creative ardor was immediately directed to all the different branches of her political economy. He repaired and enlarged the arsenals of the Musa, Rotterdam, and Helvoslees. His there two ships of the line could not reach Amsterdam and could only be conveyed thus. By dint of vast expense and labor, it being necessary to convey them on buoys, unladen and without their guns, to the opening of the Zuiderzee. This operation did not suit the rapidity necessary in the great enterprises of the period, and the emperor determined to remove the northern arsenal to a situation in which it would be exempt from these disadvantages. He accordingly gave orders for the establishment or improvement of the Nivendo, where in a short time 25 ships of the line were provided with a safe winter station and laid up besides magnificent keys. This important point was defended by the military establishments of the Helder, which formed the key of Holland. Napoleon's plan was to make the Nivendo the Antwerp of the Zederzee nine works on the Vaser, the M, and the Elba. When Napoleon joined Bremen, Hamburg, and Ludwig to the Empire, his plans and works extended with his dominion. He took measures for rendering the Elba accessible to ships of the line and projected a maritime arsenal at Delft's Hill at the mouth of the M. But the object which particularly engrossed the attention of Napoleon was the cutting of a line of canals, which with the help of the M, the Vaser, and the Alba, would have affected a junction between Holland and the Baltic. We should thus have been enabled to communicate safely and by a simple system of inland navigation from Bordeaux and the Mediterranean with the powers of the North. We should easily have obtained from them all kinds of naval productions for our ports and we should have been able to send out against them when we chose our flotillas from the Channel or Holland. All these important works were planned and most of them executed with amazing rapidity. The creative genius of Napoleon conceived them and the minister de Cray indefatigably prosecuted the designs that were suggested. The plans were drawn and the works executed by Prony, Zigensen, Cachan, and others. The names attached to such monuments are 
imperishable. If to what has here been described, he added other simultaneous prodigies in every other branch of the public service and in every other part of the territory, and if it be considered that all were executed amidst perpetual war and without more, perhaps even with less burdens than now, after long peace, weighed on the countries that composed the vast French empire, it is impossible to repress astonishment in admiration, all these miracles were effected by steadiness of determination, talent armed with power, and finances wisely and economically applied. Certainly, if in addition to what has already been mentioned, the massive fortifications, the multitude of public roads, bridges, canals, and edifices of various kinds to be taken into account, it must be acknowledged that no sovereign in the world ever did so much in so short a time and by imposing so few burdens on his people.